Um, welcome everyone today. Welcome to Jay. He's um, back on campus. He was here a few years ago for our Gateway Grant and I know we had um, really great reviews from when he was on campus with us a few years ago and just excited that he can be back today. He's the author of um, the book, Discussion in the College Classroom, and he's going to share with us today some great strategies that you can probably take with you and use right now to engage learners in both synchronous and asynchronous, small and large enrollment classes, um, just a little bit of something for everyone. And with that, um, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. Um, we're going to try to make this as interactive as we can. So again, at any point, feel free to um, use the chat to ask a question or make a comment. And I am going to begin by asking you to do just that. Why should you bother engaging students in the classroom? Why should you bother seeking to engage students? Please put your comments in the chat. Because when, when you think about it, there's some risk when it comes to engaging students, right? There, you may ask a question and be greeted with silence, or they may say something that's not helpful at all, or, or that works against the goals you have for the class. All right, great, you're jumping right in. I see we've got some, Lisa says it improves learning. So does Candace, uh, Tom helps them. You guys are on top of this learning thing. To make learning and teaching more enjoyable, I'm with you there, Kimberly. Uh, Sharon, to get their perspective. Yeah, it's a good reminder that students can learn from each other as well as from the professor in the classroom. Candace says more fun. Um, Stacy, group learning. I find this very powerful, especially in my ethics class. Yeah, group learning is fabulous in those kinds of discussions. Uh, keeps them active, says Tara. I agree, very helpful. Wakes them up, right? Hopefully we are keeping them awake in the classroom. So that is true. All right, you guys are good. You're just hitting so many right away that um, I'm, I can't even keep up with them all. But that's, uh, Stacy. You, you sure you need me to do this workshop? It seems like you've got a bunch of really good teachers in, in the room here offering really good responses. So what would I say in response to that question? I think you've hit most of them. For number one, there's good evidence that suggests learning improves when students are actively engaged in the classroom. And one of the primary ways university faculty seek to engage students is by engaging them in classroom discussion. So that's, that's number one. As a matter of fact, if you look at the now, what, about 40 years of research in the scholarship of teaching and, and learning, the number one takeaway I would argue from that is students learn more when they're engaged in class rather than when they're being passive. So you guys hit that one on the head. Critical thinking skills. I don't know if anybody mentioned um, engagement improves critical thinking skills, but um, give me a, a thumbs up either you know in person using your thumb or using a, a symbol. If, if you have a syllabus, where you say one of the goals of your course is to teach critical thinking. Come on, if you've got, got that on a syllabus in one of your classes, let's see a thumbs up here, right? Yeah, it should be about everybody. It's, it's almost a ubiquitous goal for college courses. We all say we teach critical thinking. Well, one way to do that is to get students engaged. As several of you pointed out, getting students perspective making them co-creators of knowledge and understanding. And hopefully it makes class more fun and interesting as I find if I listen to myself ramble for 50 or 75 minutes, I get bored with me. I'm sure students get bored with me as well. One of the uh, ways of sort of capturing this sentiment comes from a book by Elizabeth Barclay called Student Engagement Techniques. And Elizabeth makes the very compelling claim, the one doing the most work in the classroom is the one doing the most learning. And I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves, who's doing the most work in our classes? If you're doing all the talking, all the lecturing, and students are able to sit passively in class, you're probably reinforcing your own learning, right? You're, you're a master of this content. However, your students 
probably aren't learning as much as you hope they would be. So getting them engaged, shifting the burden of work into cl in class onto students helps ensure that students are the ones doing the most learning. All right, we're gonna go to our first poll here. And I wanna ask you about what are the challenges for engaging students in discussion in the classroom? We've talked about why we should do it, but often we don't do it, all right? So this is a one question, multiple choice poll, which you should be able to see now. Um, I want you to respond to the question, what's the biggest challenge you face in using discussion in your classes? And you can select multiple responses if you'd like to do so. All right, so what are the uh, biggest challenges here? What keeps us from engaging students, particularly utilizing discussion? All right, let's take a look at the results. What did you have to say? All right, so let's see. We've got number one there, silence. We're worried that nobody speaks up. And it is amazing how painfully long five seconds of silence in the classroom can seem, right? We, we ask a question and if nobody jumps in right away, we're all getting really uncomfortable now, right? Just in those few seconds, right? So silence is a worry. Um, unprepared students, right? That's often a worry of faculty members that Students haven't done the reading, they haven't watched the video or listened to the podcast, they're not prepared to effectively engage. So we worry about that one as well. Uh, the problem of dominant talkers. There are some students that are quite happy to process out loud for us and will take up all the um, airtime in the classroom. Um, we've got just a few there for fear that I won't know how to respond to their comment and wrong or potentially misleading answers. So those are all concerns that hopefully we're going to be able to um, address here throughout the course of our online workshop this afternoon. But I'm a sociologist by training, and my whole approach to interaction in the classroom is grounded in sociology. And one of the things that you'll find in every introductory sociology textbook is the concept of social norms. And social norms are taken for granted assumptions. They're kind of rules or guidelines about how you ought to behave in a social situation. And a social situation is any context where there's another person present. Right, so even something as simple as riding on an elevator, there are a list of rules as long as your arm for how you ought to behave in riding on an elevator. So let's have you uh, type again into the chat. Give me an example of a rule, a social norm for riding on an elevator. What have we got here? Right. What are some of the rules you follow? when you get on that elevator, right? Don't push all the buttons, stand facing the door, right? That's a really good one. Was that Allison? I think it shot by so fast. Um, just imagine you're waiting for that elevator, the door's open and there I am facing the back of the elevator, right? Are you gonna get on that elevator with me? If I'm facing the wrong direction, you very well might not, right? Um, when you're by the keypad, you punch for other people, um, don't talk, it's awkward. Yeah, you don't wanna make you know, personal conversation, maybe small talk. Try not to be too close to the next person, right? There are all kinds of personal space rules for riding on an elevator, right? If you're the only person on the elevator, you can stand anywhere you want, right? You can stand in the middle, on the side, in the front, in the back, you can jump up and down, you can pick your nose, it doesn't matter. You're the only person on the elevator. But as soon as a second person gets on that elevator, magically, there's this invisible line drawn in the center of the elevator, and you go to one side, and the next person goes to the other side. Imagine how awkward it would be if, let's say, you didn't know Stacy, and you're riding the elevator, the door opens, and Stacy, a complete stranger, 
comes and stands shoulder to shoulder right next to you instead of going to the other side of the elevator. What are you going to think about Stacy at that point in time, right? You're going to you're going to wonder about her and her her ability to read social norms and follow those kinds of social guidance, right? So we tend to follow a lot of rules. Let me skim through. Small talk might be okay. Let the kids push the buttons. No bodily functions. Yeah, that's a good one, right? And and it's interesting if you have children, how they begin, and you've got to coach them on these norms, right? I remember once riding on an elevator where there was an individual wearing too much perfume or cologne, and my you know three-year-old immediately says, what's that smell at the top of her voice, right? And like, okay, hush, hush. You don't, you pretend not to notice those things on an elevator, right? That's one of the uh, social norms we have to abide by. Well, it's not only riding in elevators for which we have social norms. The college classroom has some social norms as well, which are related to our topic of discussion and engagement in the classroom. Now, there are lots of norms beyond those related to engagement. You know, so for example, the norm regarding where students sit. So you probably all noticed this and have taken it for granted, but wherever a student sits on the first day of class, that becomes their seat for the rest of the semester, right? So they sort of feel like, okay, I own that chair. And let's say, all right, I'm gonna pick on somebody. I see Alex there kept his camera, camera on. Thank you, Alex. Let's say Alex has been sitting in the front row, front and center. You know, Alex is you know, one of those very aggressive learners and wants to be engaged and doesn't wanna miss every, anything. So he's there every class period sitting in the front row. And then Alex, you've been in the front row for three weeks in a row. And then Connie, is sitting there on the first class meeting of the fourth week. And Alex, what do you think about Connie at that point? Yeah, thumbs down, right? She's violating a social norm. That's your seat, right? You sat there on the first day of class. It belongs to you. So we have all kinds of norms that guide our behavior in the college classroom. One of them identified by a couple of researchers working at Boston College in the late 1970s actually, but my own research and research of others have continued to affirm that these norms are in operation in the college classroom, is the norm of civil attention. Now, what do you suppose is the difference between paying attention and paying civil attention? So David Karp and William Yoles argued that in the college classroom, students aren't really required to pay attention they're only required to pay civil attention. So what might the difference be between paying attention and paying civil attention? Anybody got an idea? Can you pop it into the chat for us? How is it different? Okay, Stacy, great. Civil attention is politeness. It's when you look like you're paying attention, but you're not really. And as Justin says, at least you're not being disruptive, right? You create the appearance of paying attention. You guys make great sociologists, right? We should all make you honorary members of the uh, sociology department. And you've got it exactly right. Civil attention says students only need to create the appearance of paying attention. So there's sort of this taken for granted norm between professors and students. As long as you look like you are paying attention, I'm not gonna pick on you. I'm not gonna bother you with the exception of a few disciplines and a few strong-willed personalities, most of us don't do cold calling in the classroom. We won't call on students unless they're somehow signaling to us they're willing to be called upon. So students can get away with only paying civil attention. All right, well, let's try a different tool. I want you to type in how do students demonstrate civil attention? Okay, go to annotate, then hit text, then click on the screen and type in an example. Nodding, that's a great one, right? Eye contact, right? Eye contact is good, but you gotta be a little bit careful about eye contact, right? There's a danger that if, if you hold the instructor's gaze, 
you're giving the instructor permission to call upon you. So fleeting eye contact, right? Note taking, good one. Looking at us when we're speaking, not falling asleep. Okay, that's good, right? Looking at the screen in, in the front of the room or online, nodding, smiling. Great, great. All of those are good examples of how students demonstrate civil attention in the classroom. Laughing when appropriate, not looking at their phone, right? And that's one of the reasons why we get so annoyed with students when they have their phones out is they're not even paying civil attention. They're paying attention to something else, right? So um, any others popping up there? Note-taking, eye contact, good, good. You guys, you guys are doing great. I appreciate that. All right, so students, because we won't cold call in most cases, if you teach a language, sometimes with um, mathematics, um, professors will call upon students without their indicating they're willing to be called upon. Um, but in general, we won't do that. Yeah. So there, maybe if you've never used annotate before, there's a new tool for when you're teaching synchronously online. And there's another norm that is pervasive in the college classroom. And I'm willing to bet that you've seen this one in action as well. Carpen Yoles gave it the label, the norm of consolidation of responsibility. And this norm has been replicated in numerous other studies, including my own. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a, a study I did with a couple of graduate students. We were looking at classroom interaction in introductory sociology courses. So we were holding the course being taught constant. We had nine different instructors teaching 15 sections of introductory sociology. And I've done other studies that included a variety of classroom types, and it doesn't change even when you change the classroom type. The average class size was 39. And we observed four meetings of each class session kept track of who spoke and how often they spoke in the classroom. So we use seating charts to track who is speaking and how often. We also then surveyed students toward the end of the semester, but I'll get to that part of the data in a little bit. And what we discovered in these introductory sociology classes was that it really looked like these professors were doing a bang up job right? There was an average of 49 student verbal comments in the average 75-minute class period. So if you think about that, almost 50 comments in a 75-minute period, that's one student verbal participation every 90 seconds. And I don't know about you, but in my classes, if I get one student speaking up every 90 seconds, I'm patting myself on the back all the way to my office after class. What a great job I did, right? I had almost 50 comments in class today. It was a great discussion. Aren't I a wonderful professor? Didn't I do a great job in class today? But there's a problem here. There is a problem with this data at this point. Anybody want to unmute and tell us what's the problem with this way of looking at the data? It was all the same people speaking. Thank you, Kimberly. That's exactly right. That's what the consolidation of responsibility is. Only 30% of the students spoke up at all. That meant 70% of the students in the typical class meeting session observed the professor having a great discussion with 12 of their classmates. So 27 watched 12 engage in a discussion. And it would even gets worse than that because regardless of class size, five to seven students will make 75 to 95% of student comments. So Kimberly was right on target with this one. And it doesn't matter how big or small your class is. You can have a class of 15, roughly five students are gonna do the vast majority of the talking. You can have a class of 50, roughly five students will do the vast majority of the talking. You can have a class of 200, roughly five students are gonna do the vast majority of the talking. And that was exactly what we found 
in our research was that a very small number of students accounted for almost all of the talking. All right, so we're ready for a second poll here. This one has six questions. All right, I'm gonna launch it. So I'd like you to respond to these six questions. In this case, you only get one choice per question. All right, so please go through. This is mostly about who, which type of students thinking demographically are the ones that are most likely to engage in discussion. So answer all six of the questions and then click submit at the end. We'll give you a minute or so here. Which students are most likely to participate? Let's end the poll and I will share the results. Okay, the first question, which are most likely to participate, traditional 18 to 24 year olds or non-traditional students over 25? It looks like three quarters of us think it's gonna be the non-traditional students. All right, and we'll, we'll get the uh, right answers here in a minute. Uh, which students are most likely to participate? Students in female taught courses or students in male taught courses? Wow, a lot of confidence in female faculty members to get students engaged. Where are the students most likely to participate in discussion sitting? We've got almost everybody saying in the front of the room, which students are most likely to participate, males or females? We've got a, uh, what, about a 14% advantage for males over females and whites versus non-whites, heavily in favor of white students, it's unanimous. And then students who talk frequently and students who talk rarely agree that the student role requires all of the following except which. And we've got over half saying participation in discussion. All right, well, let's take a look and see what the um, results of our research were. And you, you folks, again, I, I think Stacy's gonna think twice about inviting me back because you guys keep getting the right answers. You know what's, what's going on here, which speaks very well of you as classroom instructors that you're reflective and observant. Um, clearly, some of you have taught non-traditional students before as there is a significant difference based on student age by a four to one margin we found in this particular study that older students, more life experience, maybe more self-confidence, were much more likely to speak up than traditional 18 to 24 year olds in the mixed age classroom. Instructor gender, you got it right as well. Uh, women instructors uh, got about three times as many comments as male instructors teaching the same introductory sociology course. So we're not you know, saying, well, it's because men teach chemistry and there's so much content we have to cover in chemistry that you know, there's no time for discussion. No, we, we controlled for course and, and women doing a better job. Seating third, you, you got it right. Um, they were mostly there in the very front third of the room. So students sitting in the front third were twice as likely to speak up as students sitting in the middle or the back third of the classroom. Now, what we didn't find, we did not find a statistically significant difference either by gender or by race. Um, the gender differences that do show up in the research tend to be based on either very small samples. Um, for example, one of the studies that gets cited frequently is about a single graduate level course, a single graduate level course with only about 15 students in it. And there were some dominant males in that classroom. But generally when you find a difference between male and female students, it's a result of using a survey research method. Both males and females overestimate how much they're talking in class, but male students overestimate by a very big margin. So they, because they overestimate their participation to a much greater extent than female students overestimate, if you ask students to self-report in a survey, 
you may find a difference there. But if you're basing your data on classroom observations and counting who's talking and how often, it's much less frequent that you find a statistically significant difference. It goes back to uh, about the 1970s with the so-called chilly climate thesis that higher education was a chilly or hostile, unwelcoming climate for women. May have been true in 1970. Is it true in 2022? The, the evidence doesn't point to that to the same degree as it may have been true in 1970. And there's been very little research on the impact of student race in the classroom. Certainly there are language barriers. barriers. If you're talking about uh, racial differences that are also connected to people speaking English as a second language rather than as their first language, you can find some differences but we could not find any statistically significant differences. However, we did find some compelling anecdotal examples. So for example, um, one of the days when I was observing a kind of a mass intro section, this class had about 100 students in it, and the subject for the day was crime and society, and the professor started talking about um, police profiling and asking for students' experiences or understanding of police profiling. And on that particular day, the African-American men in class became the dominant talkers, right? They had some very vivid personal experiences where they felt like they had been profiled by police because of their race and their gender. So on that day and that topic, African-American men became the dominant talkers. But generally speaking, we could not find any differences that were statistically significant. All right, as I mentioned, we also surveyed students um, toward the end of the semester and asking them about what are your responsibilities as a student in the classroom. And those students who spoke up more than twice we defined as talkers, and those that spoke up twice or less per class period, we defined as non-talkers. You might, many of them were occasional talkers that might speak up once or every other class period or something like that. But we compared them on what they thought their responsibilities were. And there was a high level of agreement on a lot of things. Both the talkative students and the quieter students agreed they were responsible for completing assignments, doing the reading, paying attention in class, studying, learning, asking for help when they needed. But the one area where they disagreed was whether or not it was a part of students' responsibility to speak up and participate in discussion in class. The talkative student said, well, yeah, that's, that's part of your job as a student is to speak up in class. But the quieter students viewed it as much more of an optional component. They did not perceive it as a requirement in their courses. They could speak up if they wanted to, but it wasn't something they viewed was their responsibility. It was a required behavior for college students. And so you guys got this one right as well. Perhaps the subject of this workshop gave that one away, maybe. I don't, I don't I'm not sure. Um, but this points to the need to have a discussion about discussion with your students on that first day of class. You guys immediately jumped right in and said, we need to engage students because they learn more. We know we need to engage students and get them talking because they can learn from each other as well as from you, the professor. We know that students can develop critical thinking skills if we can get them talking in class. So it's important to share that with students. I'm not trying to get you engaged because I'm lazy and didn't want to prepare a lecture. I'm trying to get you engaged in talking because it's going to help you learn. And that can help students understand that there's a reason why you're asking them to speak up, just as you ask them to read assignments, just as you ask them to write essays or papers, 
just as you ask them to take exams and quizzes, being engaged in discussion is a learning tool. And having that discussion with students may help with that problem of silence that we're worried about, right? If students know it's an expectation and they know it will help them be successful in the course. All right, um, what's changed in the past 15 years? That's a great question, Anastasia. Um, the research that I've seen shows the consolidation of responsibility hasn't changed. Um, I have not seen research on non-binary students. So as far as I know, there isn't any scholarship out there. So it's a great topic if you want to investigate it as a uh, scholarship of teaching and learning article. I'd say that would be really helpful if um, you or someone else would try to tackle that, that topic. All right. Um, so what can we do to change classroom norms? How can we change the assumption that, well, speaking up in class, being engaged is, is merely optional? How do we get students to recognize that civil attention is not enough, to recognize that um, we can't rely on five of our classmates to do all of the talking, that we need to get others engaged and, and talking as well? Well, my first piece of advice is change the norm on the first day of class. That first day of class is critical for establishing norms in your classroom. If you show up on the first day of class and you take attendance, you read the syllabus to the students, and you, you talk about you know, the big paper assignment at the end of the semester, and yours is the only voice ever heard out loud in class on that first day of class, you just told students the consolidation of responsibility and civil attention are the rules in your classroom. Those are the norms. So you've got to communicate to students on that first day, civil attention is not enough. Relying on five of your classmates to do all the talking is not going to work in this class. We're going to have some different social norms here. So whether you use some sort of icebreaker or introductions related to the course, one of my favorite things is rather than read the syllabus to the students, I put students in small groups of five to eight students on the first day of class, give that group one two-sided sheet of paper with multiple choice questions about the syllabus. And they, as a group, first thing they're asked to do is share contact information so that if, if they're, they miss a class session, they've got four other classmates they can contact. Would you be willing to share your notes and tell me what went on in the class session that I, that I missed? But then they go through and it's like, well, what are Professor Howard's office hours? Where is his office? Which books are required for this class? Those just-in-time quizzes, you know, when are they due? And if um, I want to access the uh, videos in the learning management system, where do I find them? So I give them a multiple choice quiz over the syllabus. I actually had a couple of students because I, I had listed on the, um, the syllabus that was posted on the learning management system prior to the first day of class. I had some students come in one day in a bit of a panic that we saw there's gonna be a quiz over the syllabus and, and we've read it, but it's really hard to memorize all of that. And it's okay, it's, it's an open syllabus, syllabus quiz. You're gonna be fine, right? The goal here is everybody gets 100% on the first day and they're all starting off with an A plus at the end of the first day of class and getting them off to a good start. But that gets them talking to one another, right? You've established the norm that you can't simply be quiet in this class and that we're gonna to expect to, to learn from one another. One of my favorite books on college teaching is Ken Bain's What the Best College Teachers Do. And Bain spends a lot of time talking about how to engage students in the classroom. He offers five steps, provide a provocative question or problem guide the students into appreciating the significance of this question. Why does it matter? Why is it important? To encourage their critical thinking about the question, 
create an environment that attempts to, or that supports the students rather, in the attempt to address the questions and hopefully lead the questions, lead the students with additional questions and a curiosity, a desire to know more about those things. So that's Bain's advice. And I think that's advice that we can take to our online teaching as well. Stacy tells me, probably just like at Butler, post-pandemic, we're doing more online teaching, both synchronously and asynchronously, than we did prior to the pandemic. So what I want you to do now with some help from Stacy is we're going to randomly put you into pairs into um, breakout rooms. And I will post Bain's five um, points here into the chat. And I want you to think about this, particularly in relation to online teaching. How can we take what Ken had to say, or maybe some of the things we've already talked about, and apply them in an online context? Now, if it turns out that um, both of you in the breakout room um, never teach online, feel free to change the rules and say, we're going to talk about um, these principles in a face-to-face -face class rather than in a online learning circumstance. All right, so I'm going to post Bain's advice there into the chat. And Stacy, if you could go ahead and send people to breakout rooms, we're going to give you about three minutes tops, okay? So join your room, jump right in, see if you can come up with a couple of strategies here. All right, looks like we're all back. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment. And all right, I'm gonna let you run with this in whatever direction you chose to do so, whether you talk specifically about Bain suggestions or any other ideas for how to facilitate student engagement in discussion in your classrooms. Now, normally what you do in this circumstance, it's sort of an online think pair share, is you ask for volunteers. And if you ask for volunteers, who volunteers? Those five students, right? Those same five students. So I don't want volunteers. I want people to volunteer their partner, right? So if you had somebody in your breakout room that said something really good, unmute yourself and call them out and say, share your idea, Valerie, or you know, what, what it was you said. It was so good, I think everybody needs to hear it. So who had a brilliant partner? Un unmute yourself and call out your brilliant partner and make them speak. Alex, what do you wanna share? All right, Alex, you've been affirmed. It's safe for you yeah. to speak up. Well, I mean, truthfully, we didn't, get the, the the five points in the mm -hmm. chats so. that was on me <laughs> yes Sorry. we didn't quite talk through them but <laughs> changing um norms in the classroom we're getting students engaged whether online or in person or you're just waiting for me to get it into the chat well one thing we discussed is um i was telling alex i teach 100 percent virtually for uh -huh. a company and my, my my kids are in louisiana and okay when you have somebody answer like seventh period today, I teach math and you know, I'm just gonna give a real simple example. What, okay, everybody, what's eight minus five? And this one boy, bless his heart, would answer every single question. But when I'd say what's eight minus five, he'd say something like seven. <clears throat> How do you gracefully <laughs> let someone know the answer is incorrect without discouraging them or right. the rest of the class? Because if, I mean, if you're gonna come out and write, Right, right. And say, oh no, that's wrong. No one is ever going to answer <laughs> again. Yeah. No, I mean, how do you diplomatically do that? Well, you're you're absolutely right in that you have to do it diplomatically. If 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 you're if you come across as harsh or condemning or condescending, they're going to shut up for the rest of the semester and won't talk to you. You know, so you you know you can do things like, well, that's a good effort, Alex. <laughs> you know, that's a good try. You know, but. But let's, you know, who else has has a response? Let's let's see what what would you say? And and that's also helpful sometimes when you get the people that have been listening to too much misinformation. And then you, know, you and keep they coming back with something multiple... that they take for granted is true that is not true. 
The same what kid would come back with multiple other responses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, you know, what I find I, I do a lot is I say, well, you know, that's a really good, you know, progressive liberal talking point. You know, that that's a good point. But let's let's imagine for a minute. I want I want you as a class to imagine. Let's assume you're that Fox News conservative. How would you challenge or disagree with the point that was just made if you're on the conservative end of the spectrum or vice versa and say, you know, take on the persona of somebody who disagrees rather than saying you, Angie, have to tell Alex you disagree with him. But, you know, Angie, sort of pretend you disagree with Alex. What would you say to him? You know, what evidence might you try to marshal if you were going to argue with Alex about his progressive or conservative or libertarian or whatever it is kind of um, talking point? I like and, and that. And that can Thank help you. in, you know, in sociology, we talk about, you know, basic theoretical ways of looking at society. You know, there's, in any intro textbook, you'll find functionalist theory, conflict theory, interactionist theory. And I will sometimes say, well, that, that's a good conflict theory perspective. You know, that's exactly how they would look at it. But if you were a functionalist, what would you say? What other angle would you have on this topic? And how would you, you view it differently? But, but Angie, you're absolutely right. If you're not diplomatic about it, you're going to have trouble. All right. Who else has got a partner that had something beneficial for you that, that you learned from? Call out your partner and make them speak. Well, somebody in, in my group talked about uh, points for participation or requiring participation, but I didn't remember who it was exactly. That'd okay. be me. I do All it right. students. We start week one, sink or swim. Right. <laughs> so, so Stacy, you use some kind of a point system. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's classroom participation. And for my on-campus and face-to-face -face students, we do it it's a twice a week class, Tuesday, Thursday. So Tuesday, we spend our entire time talking about ethics concepts. Thursday, we apply them in the form of usually case study analysis. And we're in engineering. So usually we're destroying a bridge or crashing a plane <laughs> and killing people yet again. There's a reason there's 50 shows called engineering disasters, okay? So my on-campus folks come to class, I can really steer that and push them towards, okay, but how do we apply our ethics principles? With my online folks, I do it in discussion boards, and I tell them, you just plain got to show me you know the principles. Keep it conversational, and you're replying to each other. That's part of your score, too. Great, great. So do you assign those scores? I do. Yeah, and do you do it at the end of every class period, or how do you do it? Uh, for the on-campus folks, I float table to table. For uh -huh. the online folks, they get a few extra days because it's asynchronous. So if we're doing it Thursday, they're post every Sunday. Okay. All right, so you're posting pretty frequently there, so yep. as to what the grades are. Great strategy. All right, and anybody else? Give you one more chance before I point to the research. We've only got about eight minutes left, so should I point to the research here? Let me share my screen again. Let's see, you gotta get to the right screen. Share it there. Some of what the research shows is you talk to students outside of class that they'll be more likely to talk with you inside of class. Now, of course, North Dakota State's a pretty big university, right? You might never run into your students outside of class. So how is this helpful? Jay, come on, give me some real advice. Well, I would suggest things like show up to class five minutes early. You know, who went to see the movie that opened this weekend? Is it any good? Should I, should I watch it? You know, um, what do you guys think? You know, which which one is is better in terms of the the new, you know, was it Netflix series based on um, the Lord of the Rings? You know, the Ring of Power, or is the new series House of the Dragon better? Which one do you guys? And talk to them about things non related to the course in those five minutes, and you'll find that developing that kind of relationship can get them to talk more in class. Candace, great, having students say hi to me in the hallway. But what I find is I recognize them after I pass them. So it really helps if they're waving and saying hello to me because I'm, you know, just like they are, I'm, I'm focused on something. So it's easy for me to um, miss them when, when I'm passing them in the hallway. Um, modeling good presence, instructor online presence, you know, as, as some of you have already pointed out with, um, you know, the uh, 
chat groups on in online or discussion forums. You know, good replies can be like, you know, what what assumptions are you making to draw that conclusion? And what if we changed one of those assumptions? What evidence might cause you to come to a different viewpoint or, or conclusion to keep the conversation going? The, the danger with online forums is the first student posts and everybody says, I agree. And you never get much conversation if, if they're taking that tact. Um, back to face-to-face -face classroom, moving around the room and getting closer, right? Stacy said one of the things she does is move from group to group. If they're off task, they'll get back on task when you wander by and start eavesdropping on their conversation. Um, directly calling upon students. This is the direct questioning. What, what I find in my research is college professors are generally reluctant to do this, but you can do things like a think pair share, give them a minute to write, to pair up in response and talk about the question. Then if you directly cold call on someone, they at least have what they've written down in front of them and they've rehearsed it with another student. That makes it easier. Sometimes um, I've, I've heard this called a ticket to ride that in order to come into class, you have to have a paragraph to a page written in response to a question associated with the reading. So everybody knows they've got to have that paragraph to a page in response to the question. And you can cold call on students then. And even if they're terribly shy, they can at least read to you what they have written down, right? So by requiring that they have something written in response to the preparation, it makes cold calling a little bit easier. Um, Eliminating the consolidation of responsibility, those five students, you can say, let's hear from someone who hasn't spoken up yet. Or I've been hearing a lot from the men in class. What do the women in class think? Or I've heard a lot from the front half of the room. I want to hear from the back half of the room. You can also use carrot and sticks. I don't know if you're familiar with the teaching strategy called just-in-time teaching. Basically, you have a online quiz in the learning management system that is due two hours prior to the start of class. You spend the time reviewing those quizzes and then can call out students who gave a really good answer to the short answer question. You know, you can say, Tom, that was a really good response you had to the quiz. I want you to share with the rest of the class. You remember what you said about that? And I might have to prompt you to remember what you said, but you can then praise the students who are doing a really good job. You might anonymously take a so-so answer and cut and paste it into a PowerPoint and say, well, this is an answer that's got some strengths and some weaknesses, again, without revealing the student, and say, what's good about this, okay? How might you make this answer stronger? What would improve this response as another way of um, getting students engaged? So. Um, of course, things like breaking the class into smaller groups, giving them time to think before they um, have to respond. We've talked about provocative questions um, from Ken Bain's book, Weaker Students Need More, Stronger Students Will Need Less, Two Deadlines is a Good Idea. And I see we've got some responses here in the uh, chat. So let me go back to that to wrap it up. Um, Angie's advocating for cold calling. Right. If, if you're good at it, and Angie, you strike me as you'd have a really fun personality, so you can get away with it. If, if you're a faculty member that comes across as stern or cold, cold calling can get you into hostile, hostile relationships with your students. So it's in one part going to depend on your teaching style. One of Angie? my fellow teachers had a really good idea that she shared. Yeah. And what she does is you're at bat and you're on deck. So the yeah. first, the person that you're calling first is at bat, and then you let them know, know that the next person you're going to call is on deck. So they know that they're going to be next. It's not just a total surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that idea. Of, I do um, too. Of letting them know it's coming. Yeah. And, and another think... one shared having one person be the scribe. So they're the person doing the writing, but the rest of the class is telling them what to write and how to solve the uh -huh. problem. Right. Great. 
great. And I did put the, the Ken Bain five points back in. And we are just about at the end of our time. So I think we're going to stop there. Um, Stacy, I, I will say once again, I am thoroughly impressed with the dedicated teachers at North Dakota State. You just always seem to have a, a group of people coming to these workshops who are very reflective about their teaching, who clearly are very supportive of facilitating students' learning. So thank you, everybody, for um, allowing me to uh, have some fun interacting with you once again. And Stacy, I'll hand it back to you. Pull a second here to transition and then. OK. Oh. <laughs> uh, we had the, you know, the, the year or two that we were on Zoom. And now we have these students back in person. And um, I think my experience, I'm an English professor, so my courses have about 10 to 15 students. Um, they're supposed to be sort of discussion based. And I, I, I feel like the students um, are missing the basic kind of like, as you talked about the norms of the classroom, I think especially the first year students didn't have that uh, norms of the classroom experience. Uh, so I found um, students are speaking uh, less and also they're speaking in the classroom in a way that reminds me of how they spoke on Zoom, where you ask a sort of sophisticated question, you know, so if we have these two authors and one of them is, you know, a victim of this kind of experience of war and the other one, blah, blah, blah. so what is that, you know, how do you get to the interiority of a student who's, ex of, a, of this author who's experiencing and they're like, sadness. Okay, can you elaborate a little bit? And you sort of end up with these sort of shorter uh, right. one word questions and, um, so I guess my, uh, I don't know if it's a question, but the, the sort of thing I've been thinking about a lot this year is how not just to get them to participate, but how to get them to uh, participate in a kind of articulate, uh, thoughtful, multi-sentence way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Adam, I, I think, first of all, you're not alone. <laughs> There's, we're finding the same problems at, at Butler that, you know, students, particularly first year students whose high school experience was so disrupted by the pandemic that they're they're struggling more than first year students traditionally have so we're we're seeing a lot of the same things i i would suggest that um the the principle that weaker students need more here probably applies um rather than an open ended question in the classroom i would suggest considering something like for each class period, post in the learning management system, here's three questions. And one of them is going to require you to quote something from the reading. You know, well, you know, what in the reading gives you the hint that this author lived through this experience, right? You know, what in there makes you think that could be the case? Or, you know, contrast these two points or you know, to give them some greater structure and give them the questions ahead of time and let them know you're going to call on them, right? So here's the three questions you've got between now and the next class period to think about how you want to respond to them. And if you if nobody volunteers, I will call you out to, to speak up in response to it. And everybody is going to have to speak up before the class period is over. We're going to make sure all 15 of you have been engaged in the discussion. So I, I think in the current context in which we find ourselves, students need greater structure than what often we could get away with in the kinds of classes that, that you teach in the past where you could say, well, what did you think about X? And you'd get students starting and begin to think, and you could ask follow-up questions. And, and I think you're absolutely right, Adam. It's much harder to do that right now. They, as you say, they've been doing Zoom conversation, you know, sort of tweet versions of what should be in-depth conversation. So it's it's much harder for those students. And I think they need you to provide structure and coaching to get there. That that would be my advice. Yeah, I'm gonna take you up on that one. I'll let you know how it goes. Thank you. All right, please do, Adam. Uh, Blaine, you had a hand up earlier. You still got a question for us? I do. I will be honest, Jay. I logged in today anticipating getting other things done, as many of us do on Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> but I think you modeled this really well. It was that nice segment of three, four minutes of content and then pull us back in. So it's just far enough to almost drift off and then we're back in again. Um, 
teach a couple classes that are lecture-based, most of mine is lab. But one of the biggest hurdles I've faced in these hybrid type courses is that you have kids in the classroom and then you have students online. And you know, one of the biggest deterring pieces is how do you manage something online that's interactive and engaging? I mean, like you modeled while keeping those in class together. Have you um, had any luck blending these two together? Because it almost feels like you're better off going one route as opposed to the other. I, first of all, Blaine, thanks for, for the compliment and for noticing. I was intentionally trying to model how to do this, right? And not, not simply lecture at everybody for an hour long. So thanks for the, the affirmation. I appreciate that. Um, and also, I'm impressed with anybody that tries to do that kind of, um, the, the term that gets labeled blended or high flex learning, where you've got online students and face-to-face -face students simultaneously, it is incredibly difficult to do that well. And especially if you don't have the best of techno technology support, right? You need multiple microphones in the room so that students online can hear the students in the classroom. And it's very easy for the students online to check out, right? And be doing other things and not really paying attention because they're only talking, right? So it's not, not important. It's, it's very difficult to do both well simultaneously. Um, I would suggest because the students in the class, maybe you have the students in the classroom bring a device and zoom in as well. You know, they may have their microphone off, but that way you could use, say, for example, the Zoom polling feature um, in that case. Or you could put students who are in the classroom into a breakout room with students who are online um, to try to find ways to integrate them. Now, that's also going to depend on, you know, how big is your class? And if you've got 100 students live and another 30 online, and you're trying to put them in breakout rooms, you're just gonna have a cacophony of noise and it's not gonna work in, in the classroom. So you've really got to think about what's my context and what are the things that I can use? And if you don't wanna have everybody on Zoom, well, maybe you can use a Cahoots polling function and the students on Zoom can access the same Cahoots quiz. Um, Cahoots is an online or a polling software that you can use either online or, or in class. Um, so you, you've just got to try to think creatively. And boy, you, you, you have both my admiration and my sympathy because that is a really difficult way to teach. I think you're right. It's, it's easier to be effective one way or the other. It's really difficult to be effective when you're doing both simultaneously. So, so you've got my admiration, Blaine. All right, I saw Kimberly next. All right, let me lower my hand. There we go. Uh, so I was at the Gateways um, talk that you gave a few years back, and oh, I you're loved it. For punishment. You <laughs> yes, I loved it so much that on my first day of class, I used all the same questions you did about discussion about discussion, why bother, what challenges will we face, what solutions can we do? And so we even talk about um, the consolidation of responsibility. And so they know that I know that there will only be five students or whatever it might be in my classroom that will speak up. And we um, acknowledge that elephant in the room on the first day of class. And so I do use some of the things that you've talked about before of like, let's hear about someone who thinks differently or someone from the back of the class. And they just straight up ignore me. And I'm even okay with silence. I have waited three minutes before. Um, and it seems like the longer the silence, it's almost like the more awkward it becomes and the less likely they want to um speak, but I always wait because I don't want them to get used to that. I'll just answer right. for them if they don't. So basically my question is, what additional ideas do you have to help overcome uh, the consolidation of responsibility? Well, I, I would offer the carrot of a few points. 
um, as, as you've heard me say in the past, since you've been to the live version of the workshop, I pass around little squares of paper at the end of every class period. Students give them a grade of say one to four. You put the rubric in the syllabus. You know, if they show up and say nothing, they can get the one, right? But to get at least a two, you've got to say something out loud so other people can hear it. And it's always amazing to me what students will do for a tiny number of points, right? And I'm, and I'm also coaching, these are the easy points in the class, right? The exams are hard, the papers are hard. You wanna maximize these points. All you've gotta do is speak up twice and you're gonna maximize your points. You're assigning 10% of your total course grade to yourself. And I, I find those, those carrots tend to be very um, motivating. Now, education faculty, let's see, Stacy, your education, right? You know, Stacy's probably frowning at me right now because you know, it's supposed to be intrinsic motivation that you know, we want students to want to learn and not learn for the sake of a few points or you know, a, a gold star or a piece of candy or whatever. And I, and I get all that, but also I become something of a, um, a neoclassical economist. I think students respond to incentives and um, giving them a few points is an incentive and that, that works for me. And doing it every class period forces them to reflect and say, have I been doing my fair share or have I not? So, Can I just clarify with the points sure. thing? Um, yeah. You said it was in total 10% of their whole grade and it was five points per class and they could get one for showing up, two yeah. for speaking up once, five for speaking up twice. Was that it? Yeah, let, let me see if I've got a slide here with that on it. Um, this, this is not a magic formula. It's just the one I happen to use and it, it works for me. Right. So, all right, share. All right. So you should be able to see that if, if you're interested. Okay. Let's see, Daniel, I see you've got a hand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for um, your time today and for a helpful talk. Um, a, a quick comment and then a question. Um, I, I think your suggestion of, um, Having in-person students on Zoom um, can be a really good practice. I have heard from some of my students that, um, you know, Zoom being on Zoom can be a big battery sucker for laptops. And so right. some students who are, are aren't on a rely, you know, depending on their laptop, if they're in, if they can't mm -hmm. be near an outlet or something, that that might discourage some of those students from being in the classroom. Right. If if they know they need to be on Zoom, they might. I don't know, just mentioning that, but that's something I've run into. Um, but my question is, uh, you know, there are so many reasons why someone might not vocally participate in class, um, including um, some legitimate barriers they're experiencing to feeling like they can speak up, um, or it might be difficult in the moment to, to um, to formulate a response and find the right time to get a word in, um, uh, and that can make it harder to even harder to listen. Um, so, do you have any recommendations for um, either making sure we're valuing valuing other kinds of participation that aren't just speaking in class discussion, or um, <clears throat> encouraging and even noticing and recognizing active listening that that is more than just civil participation, but still isn't speaking. Yeah, yeah, and I, I've seen a number of faculty doing quite the similar things to what you're describing, Daniel. I mean, you can create a rubric that says, well, I was here, but I was kind of zoned out, or I was here and I was actively listening, and maybe you make them, you know, in that case, do kind of the, uh, the muddiest point or most important thing so that in addition to turning in X number of points for themselves, they say, this is what I felt was the most important point today. So they're somehow affirming to you that they really were actively listening um, kind of thing. So that, that might be a, a strategy as well. Another strategy I've seen people use is say, well, if you didn't feel comfortable speaking up in class, you can go to the discussion forum on the learning management system and post something there. 
and thereby earn your points. So I, I think that's, that's valid. Um, I think part of college though is also encouraging those introverted personalities to share as often the introverted personalities have really good things to say. And if you could just find a way to pull it out of them, they can really help their, their classmates learn. But you're right, speaking up verbally is not the only way to be engaged in, in the classroom. And I, I encourage thinking about other ways of developing rubrics. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Justin. Thanks, Jay. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts about uh, asynchronous courses, discussions in asynchronous courses, and in particular, anything that gets beyond the discussion board? <laughs> Thanks. It's, yeah, yeah. You're, you're asking about a very hard topic there, Justin. So I, I suspect you've taught online before as well, right? I've been there and done that. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult in online courses. Um, number one, I think you've got to divide the class into teams. You know, even if you have a group of 30 and you're asking everybody to post twice, that's a whole lot of time. And some people won't post until the last minute, right? And you're expecting everybody to read everybody else's comments. I think you've got to put them into groups of no more than eight so that it's manageable for them. And I think the other key is kind of what Ken Bain had to say, you've got to have a provocative question. Um, you've got to have a question for which there can be more than one response in order to get students to engage. Um, and I think like you, you know, I've used the discussion boards where you know, you've got to make one post by Wednesday and you've got to respond to somebody by midnight on Sunday and you know, trying to get, but then, all the responses come in after 10 p.m. Sunday night, right? So it's it's this um, uphill battle of uh, trying to uh, get students to participate. And then, of course, you've got all those groups that you at least at least need to you know bop into once in a while and see how things are are going. Um, one other, it's it's sort of a discussion between you and the student is those um, quizzes that are associated with the readings or videos or podcasts, whatever the assignment is. I typically do two questions, one of which is a factoid from the reading, a little piece of information. If you do the reading, you're gonna bump into this question. You'll get the right answer. And then the second is a short answer question where basically it's not phrased this way, but what I'm trying to get them to do is, is answer, what is the author's thesis? And do you find the argument compelling? Why or why not? And get them to react. Well, they're claiming this, and here's why I think they're right, or here's why I'm not sure they're right. Rarely will they say, I think the author is wrong. They might say, well, I'm not fully convinced, but you know this part, but what about X? And so I'm trying to get them to interact with the reading in a way that is, is meaningful. And, and I find students will do that in a pretty direct short answer question. Whereas if you leave it too open-ended, then they all kind of fall into, well, I agree with what the last person said kind of, kind of response. So that's, that's a suggestion, but yeah, you're, you're onto one of the challenges of online teaching, Justin. Thank you. Sure. So Jay, I'm bringing a question from someone who couldn't be here today. Um, okay. And I'm sure you've heard this one before. So his question is around time. And so he, um, he feels the pressure of just having a lot of content in his class. And so what he, what he pointed out is active learning um, takes time, you know, away from content coverage. And he's just wondering, um, you know, he feels really nervous about that. And I was just wondering if you have any thoughts or suggestions yeah. about um, that particular challenge. You're right. I've, I've, I've heard this question before. You're absolutely right. Um, a couple of things. Um, number one, I would say just because we said something out loud in the classroom doesn't mean anybody learned anything, right? And quite often, there's probably very little learning going on if we're just putting forth content 
in rapid fire fashion in order to cover everything that we think we need to cover. And so I think we as faculty and as departments need to think about our curricula and say, what is it students really need to learn? Because you can't cover 30 chapters in an introductory textbook hitting one chapter a day throughout the course of the semester. Students aren't gonna learn that way. It just won't work. They're not even gonna read the textbook, right? I mean, that's what the research shows. Even in highly selective universities, if you don't attach some sort of incentive, some points to doing the reading, then maybe one out of five students will read prior to class. And I'm thinking of a study at Northwestern University, pretty selective university. One out of five students did the reading prior to class. You know, I think, well, I'm in trouble then. If at Northwestern, they can only get one out of five. So we've got to think about how do we make that outside of class work more compelling? And then that brings in the flipped classroom strategy. You know, if you're going to do lectures and, and make them interactive, embed quizzes, put them on the learning management system and use the time in class to reinforce the most important learning that needs to happen. You know, give them a sample engineering problem and we're gonna have you work through this problem in small groups. We demonstrated it in the recorded lecture online or it was available in the reading or it was demonstrated in the YouTube video that you're using to show how to do this but use the time in class for active learning and try to spread the content to the flipped classroom approach to where it's happening outside of class and you're reinforcing the most important things with active learning in class, which means you as a faculty member have to figure out what is it that's most important? What do I really want students to learn in my class? Um, and I, I will share, and, and if it, I hope this isn't too much Jay talking about Jay, but in my introductory course, I end the semester with the final essay is students have to write a letter to a friend or a family member who's not in the course and explain three things they learned over the course of the semester that they are going to remember long after this class is over. The reality is they're going to forget 60% of what they learned in class in a matter of a couple of weeks. But what is going to stick with you and why is it important? Why do you think that matters? And then explain it without using a bunch of, in my case, sociological jargon to somebody who's never had a sociology class. So you've got to explain it in everyday language. And it's fascinating to me to see what are the students' takeaways? What do they find most compelling and most important in my class. There's a good bit of overlap there between what I think is important, but I also sometimes get surprised at the things that, that they find most valuable. Anybody else with a question? Well, once again, I, I am very impressed with um, everybody who's been participating in, in this workshop. I think North Dakota State is in, in good hands with such a large percentage of your faculty who are very reflective, who are very concerned about, about student learning. And every time I interact with folks from North Dakota State, I'm, I'm impressed. And you guys are no exception to that rule. We sure appreciate you being with us today, Jay. 